There have been a lot of great personalities in wrestling. However, perhaps no one in the history of the industry has been able to perform with such an excellent grasp of psychology more than Jake the Snake Roberts. Yes, whether it be his masterful ability to hold crowds in the palm of his hand with his in-ring work, or his often chilling promos that proved you didn't have to shout to be heard. Few, if any, have ever built a more compelling character than him. But of course, with this delving into his own psyche came a whole host of personal demons being unleashed too. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey in Jake the Snake, The Jake Roberts Story. Aurelian Smith was born in Gainesville, Texas on May 20, 1950 into a local wrestling family that was led by his father, Grizzly Smith. During the youngster's childhood, however, Aurelian would, along with his siblings Robin and Michael, have to suffer the brunt of his parents' wrath on many occasions, the full details of which are far too disturbing to go into here, but suffice to say, allegedly involved much abuse. And of course, this would all have a huge impact on the developing kids' minds, something which led to Aurelian notoriously struggling with many substance abuse problems later in life. That said, there was one escape that he and Robin had, a surprising one given their father's profession, and that was the world of professional wrestling. Yes, even with the association it had with their dark home life, the colorful world of good guys beating up bad guys still gave the two siblings some sense of comfort. And this story of watching wrestling together would eventually develop into a desire to try it out themselves, with the brother going first, as in 1974, he would begin his training in the Louisiana area, from there picking up some booking at the likes of Mid-South Wrestling, Mid-Atlantic Wrestling, and Georgia Championship Wrestling. And it was during those early days that Aurelian would develop the gimmick he would end up keeping his entire career thereafter, that being Jake the Snake Roberts, a cold and untrustworthy villain who, rather than deliver coked out interviews and use his oversized muscles like so many other performers of the day, would instead speak softly, cutting promos in an almost literary style as he forced viewers to lean in close so as to hear him clearly. All this before he would then hit the ring and take on his already psyched out opponents in a calculating manner that put brains ahead of brawn. And of course, this character, something quite unlike anyone else was doing during that era, quickly became a hit, and so it didn't take long before Roberts was traveling even further around the territory circuit, from there making appearances for the likes of Stampede Wrestling in Canada and World Class Championship Wrestling in Texas, with him even winning both television and six-man gold in the latter. His real big break, however, wouldn't come until March of 1986, when, as part of his national expansion, Vince McMahon offered the up-and-comer a contract with WWE. And so now, getting the opportunity to appear on a bigger stage than he could ever have dreamt of, Jake would make his debut at April 7th's WrestleMania II, there defeating George Wells, and afterwards draping his fully grown python, Damien, over the top of him in a spot that would soon become a regular occurrence. After that, he entered into a feud with Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, at one point even memorably DDTing the babyface star onto the concrete floor at ringside during an episode of Saturday Night's main event, something which was considered an unheard of line of violence to cross back in those days. Yes, the DDT, a move which has since become a staple of modern wrestling, had been invented by Jake himself some time prior to this, with him, as the story goes, one night grabbing an opponent in a headlock at a live show some years before, only for him to then trip and fall back, driving his opponent's head into the mat to a monster crowd reaction. And recognizing this reaction, Jake would quickly develop a way to do the move safely, as it soon became his signature attack, something which got so over with fans that, at times, it threatened to turn him babyface, as you could hear the entire crowd call out for it whenever they knew it was coming. But of course, for as good a wrestler as the Texas native was in the ring, WWE were quick to realize that he was equally as good, if not better, on the mic and so it wouldn't be long after this that he'd be given his own talk show segment on WWE TV named The Snake Pit, with this seeing him interview a number of wrestlers over the years, putting his promo skills to excellent use as he helped to build up a multitude of programs, whether they directly involved him or not. And it was on an episode of The Snake Pit later that year that Roberts would even get to interview Hulk Hogan, with this all ending in The Snake laying out the Hulkster with a DDT a move that was supposed to get booze and help to build up sympathy for the babyface ahead of a planned feud between the two. By then though, fans had taken to the dastardly heel so much that they instead cheered for him after he took out Hogan that night, 
and as a result of this, fearing he was going to be overshadowed during the match itself, the champ would backtrack and convince Vince McMahon to scrap the whole thing, as Jake instead started a beef with the Honky Tonk Man, where he could there formally switch to the side of the good guys without stealing Hulk's thunder. But while this feud was still a big deal for Roberts, sadly, it would end up being the one that saw Honky smash an ungimmicked guitar over his head during a later interview segment, with this leading to the new fan favorite starting to taking painkillers so as to deal with the subsequent injury, something which would soon spiral into full-blown addiction. Despite this, however, one silver lining of the whole incident was that it did lead to a match between the two at WrestleMania 3, where not only would Jake get his revenge, but he would also get to share the spotlight with Alice Cooper following the pinfall, this giving him some additional mainstream exposure. And after this, so popular was he becoming, he was even slated to win the Intercontinental title before the year's end. Unfortunately, however, the neck injury caused by that guitar shot still lingered on, and so, unsure if he was going to have to take time off, McMahon scrapped this instead, and instead moved the Texas boy into a feud with ravishing Rick Rude, one which would see Rude draw major heat by involving Robert's real-life wife, Cheryl, into the proceedings. But while this was all part of the show, it wasn't to say that there weren't problems going on at home for the two lovers anyway as by then, Jake's drug addiction was beginning to spiral out of control, with him now adding other substances such as cocaine and alcohol to the mix as he tried his best to deal with both the pain he was in, as well as the traumas of his childhood. Back in the ring though, he was able to weave all of this into his character work as, with his masterful grasp of psychology, he continued to be a standout of pretty much every show he was booked on, often having the crowd in the palm of his hand as they went along with every subtle movement he made and every quiet word he spoke. Come March of 1989, in fact, Jake would have gotten into a feud with the legendary Andre the Giant, with this once centering around the Frenchman's purported fear of snakes, something which the Texas boy would use to his advantage throughout. And after that, he would move on to fighting over the Million Dollar Championship with Ted DiBiase for a while, with all this culminating in a showdown at WrestleMania. It wouldn't be until the following year at WrestleMania 7, however, that Robert's mastery of psychology would be put to its greatest test, with this being where he would have a now famous blindfold match against Rick the Model Martel. And while this match could and should have by all rights been a stinker, the babyface was instead able to turn it into a highlight of the show, as he got the live audience heavily involved throughout, instructing them to cheer whenever he was pointing in the correct direction of his unseen opponent so as to help him hit the DDT. After that though, kayfabe hard times would come down upon him when Jake's python Damien was apparently crushed to death by Earthquake on the April 27, 1991 episode of Superstars of Wrestling. And while the fan favorite would get his revenge after introducing a new snake named Lucifer, he would end up turning heel soon after this, when he aligned himself with The Undertaker as the two set their sights on The Ultimate Warrior, with Roberts at that point explaining his actions by telling everyone that you should never trust a snake. And when the Warrior was fired from WWE that summer, the villainous duo would next move on to Macho Man Randy Savage, with them going as far as to crash his wedding reception, leaving the gift of a live cobra for his wife Elizabeth. What followed after that was a memorable segment on the October 21, 1991 episode of Superstars of Wrestling, where Jake would tie up Savage in the ring ropes and then from there unleash his cobra on him. Of course, the snake had been de-venomed ahead of the stunt, but it hadn't been defanged. And so, when it bit into Randy's arm that night, it quickly became clear to both men in the ring that it didn't want to let go. Following this then, Roberts would spend what felt like an eternity trying to pull the snake off his rival as blood poured from the wound it had left behind and pretty much every kid in the audience was left in tears. All of this, however, made for a highly effective segment. And so, when the two had their eventual match at December 3rd's Tuesday in Texas pay-per-view, everyone in attendance was desperate to see the babyface hero get his revenge. And while he did beat Jake that night, it would be the snake who got the last laugh after he ended up slapping Miss Elizabeth following the bout, with this drawing nuclear heat as, from there, the two continued their rivalry into the new year, eventually settling things once and for all at January 27, 1992's Saturday Night's main event, where Randy would put his opponent down for good. Following this, and Roberts would segue into a program with The Undertaker as the two former allies slowly built up to a match together at WrestleMania 8 in the weeks and months that followed. 
By the time that night would come, though, the Texas native had become thoroughly disenfranchised with the company, with this happening after he'd allegedly lobbied successfully to get a job on WWE's creative team, with Vince here apparently assuring him that he had the job, only for the boss to then later rescind this offer after Pat Patterson returned to the company following the aftermath of the Ring Boy scandal. Feeling disrespected then, Roberts would demand his release from his contract, something he would then be granted after becoming the second victim of The Undertaker's WrestleMania streak that April. In the years since, though, Jake has expressed regret over this decision, with him arguing that his state of mind had become so messed up at that point due to the cocktail of drugs and alcohol he was taking, he wasn't able to think clearly anymore. And of course, by then, this drug use had graduated to far more hardcore substances, such as crack cocaine something which Jake had taken to smoking during his latter days in the WWE and would continue to do for the foreseeable future. Of course, for most men then, this would have been time to get a wake-up call and check into rehab, but not for the snake. No, he just moved over to World Championship Wrestling instead, where he would work alongside his estranged father, Grizzly Smith, for a time, with this powder keg of a situation only managing to strengthen his demons as his substance abuse issues got all the much worse. And as if that wasn't bad enough, by the time he'd signed a formal contract with the company later that year, his proposed salary of $3.5 million was slashed to just $200,000, this coming after new management had entered the company in the form of Bill Watts, someone who Roberts had legitimate heat with from back in his Mid-South days. But having already burned his bridges with Vince McMahon by then, the Texan was forced to take the offer anyway as he from there established himself as a heel after allying with Cactus Jack and the Barbarian. And as a top heel, he would spend his initial months on the roster feuding with Sting, a feud that would ultimately culminate in a pretty awful coal miner's glove match at October 25th, 1992's Halloween Havoc. Disappointed with this too then, Jake would leave the company soon thereafter, with him from there spending the next couple of years making a living by booking various indie dates as he showed up at the likes of Smoky Mountain Wrestling, New Japan Pro Wrestling, and Mexico's AAA. Of course, those years in the wilderness would also see the Texan reassess his life after he'd found God, with him from there becoming a born-again Christian as he tried his best to abstain from drugs and alcohol going forward and news of his progress would eventually reach the hallways of WWE as it happened, with this being enough to get him a foot in the door once more in 1996, as he was brought back in as a babyface playing a similarly redeemed character who would preach the ways of the Bible, while also bringing his new snake, Revelations, along for the ride. And perhaps the peak of this run came during that year's King of the Ring tournament, when the company began pushing the redemption story of Jake winning the whole thing as a way for him to finally quench his demons once and for all. Of course, any wrestling fan from the time, however, will know that this was the year Stone Cold Steve Austin would meet him in the finals on June 23rd, with the Rattlesnake beating the fan favorite that night and then turning his born-again gimmick back on him as he went up the entrance ramp afterwards to cut his now iconic Austin 316 promo. Even in loss, though, Jake had managed to prove to fans that something had changed within him, and from there, things appeared to be continuing in the right direction even more, as the Texan moved over to a feud with Jerry the King Waller. Behind the scenes, however, his substance abuse issues would begin to resurface before long, with this relapse allegedly being brought on by his difficulty dealing with the fact that WWE, seeing his physical abilities were winding down, had wanted him to move away from the ring into a more permanent backstage role. And sadly, these issues would only get worse from there, with this ultimately leading to the company ending up releasing him from his contract once more in February of 1997. So now with both WCW and WCW's doors closed, Jake would spend the next couple of years making on and off appearances in Paul Heyman's Extreme Championship Wrestling, most notably teaming with Tommy Dreamer at 1998's November to Remember pay-per-view to take on Just Incredible and Jack Victory. For a man with as many vices as he had by then, however, perhaps in hindsight, the ECW locker room wasn't the best environment for Roberts to be placed in at that point. In fact, his drug issues would get so bad at this point that he would find himself becoming a primary character in the 1999 documentary Beyond the Mat, a documentary which would shine a light on his rapidly collapsing personal life as many fans got to see for the first time the full extent of just how far he'd fallen. Sadly though, this was far from rock bottom for him as, from there, he would only spiral further, with him next making an appearance at the now infamous Heroes of Wrestling show in October of that year and embarrassing himself even further when he showed up to the arena highly intoxicated, 
from there cutting a slurring, incomprehensible promo before going out to the ring, clearly in no condition to perform, all while his opponents tried their best to have a tag match around him. So bad was he, in fact, that this match that night wasn't even supposed to be a tag one. It was supposed to be a singles bout. After seeing just how bad he was, though, the promoters quickly realized that they couldn't have him out there alone, and so were left with little other choice than to call an audible after he was already in the ring, with the other performers involved doing their best from there to get him out of the ring as much as possible. And following this incident, American bookings would largely dry up for the former WWE superstar, as he would instead have to resort to taking small indie bookings in the UK where he would wrestle for the likes of All-Star Wrestling and the World Association of Wrestling, allegedly under the conditions that the promoters would have an 8-ball of cocaine ready for him backstage whenever he arrived. Of course, he would periodically try to clean himself up again during these years, but this never managed to stick for long, as the traumas of his youth would always be right there waiting to send him spiraling once again, something which continued even after WWE had tried to help him in 2007 as part of the blanket offer they had put out to offer rehab to any prior employees. Ultimately, it wouldn't be until Diamond Dallas Page came back into his life in October 2012 that Jake would truly turn a corner as, from there, the former WCW champion would take Roberts into his Atlanta home and put him through a rigorous recovery program that involved therapy, long put-off surgery, and a strict regimen of DDP yoga. And what a miracle that turned out to be then, because finally, after decades of circling the drain of death, Jake was able to get his demons under control, as he was now able to abstain from drink and drugs entirely, something which, bar a few small relapses here and there in the years that have followed, he has managed to maintain to this day. Less than a year after he began this process, in fact, and he was already looking like a new man, with him even able to make a cameo return to the ring again at an indie show for First State Championship Wrestling. Of course, Jake was never going to be making a full-time return to a wrestling role at this point, but what this was representative of was how far he'd come and how much he'd been able to rebuild his life out of the rubble. And if you really want to see this transformation in full, you can actually watch the whole thing as it was filmed for the documentary The Resurrection of Jake the Snake, with this currently being available on a variety of streaming services worldwide. Still though, despite being able to return to the ring at an indie show and get his health back in check again, the Texan still felt like there was one more thing he had to achieve so as to solidify his transformation, and that was get back in with WWE, with him at that point publicly stating his desire to be an entrant in the 2014 Royal Rumble. Of course, with his past history and the company unsure if he would relapse again, Vince McMahon was hesitant to put him in the ring. What he did do, however, was arguably even better than that as, after making a cameo appearance at the January 6, 2014 episode of Raw, the announcement would be made that Roberts would be getting inducted into that year's WWE Hall of Fame class, with this induction coming a few months later at April 5th, the night before WrestleMania 30. And on that night, his guardian angel DDP would even introduce him to the audience of both his fans and peers. Then he from there delivered his speech to a huge standing ovation at the end this finally completing his redemption in his mind. And since then, life has continued to be good for Jake. He survived a brief cancer scare in 2014, then went on a spoken word tour in 2016. And since 2019, he's become a full-time member of the All Elite Wrestling roster as the manager of Lance Archer, with his peerless verbal skills being put to excellent use here as he's helped to make the Murder Hawk Monster into one of the most feared competitors on the roster. And all this has had the knock-on effect of introducing a whole new generation to what he can do, as now, with the internet making it much easier to rediscover old wrestling footage, younger fans have been able to go back and see just what made him so great in the first place. And that style that he mastered back in the 80s has aged like a fine wine as it turned out because, while the cocaine-fueled promo style of Macho Man Randy Savage and the in-ring theatrics of Hulk Hogan might look overly cartoonish to younger fans today, Jake's quiet, menacing behavior remains chilling even now, with his mastery of psychology proving to be evergreen as, just as people knew then, they know now all the same that, if you don't want to find yourself in trouble, either wallowing in the muck of avarice or taking a short fall and a bad landing to the ring below, you should never trust a snake. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow Wrestle with Andy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.